you're one of these people who, I mean, that 1997 shock that, that we all remember, and, but you reinvented yourself magnificently as a TV presenter. An amazing piece of luck, actually. Because luck? Well, you think of the hundreds of people who come out of politics and who don't find another birth. Yeah. And I think it, I think it is um, largely luck. I mean, actually, I made a television programme um, shortly after I had lost my seat. And it was, it was a railway journey. It was in a series of railway journeys, but you had a different presenter each week. And I had the luck that I made it about my father, and he had been involved in the Spanish Civil War yeah. with his brothers fighting on the other side. And this was a very emotional programme, and it was maybe a side of me and a part of my story that people didn't know. Well, the luck was that 10 years later, when someone came up with this new idea of doing railway journeys and looking at history using a Bradshaw's guide, fortuitously, the woman who was the chairman of the production company had 10 years before been the commissioning editor at the BBC. And she said, ah, oh, well, if you're looking for a presenter for a railway-based programme, I saw Michael Portillo doing this very emotional programme 10 years ago about his dad. Now, what are the chances of that? I mean, that's what you call luck, isn't it? Yeah. And you see, uh, I mean, you know, as we go through life, we drop acorns along the way and some of them grow into oak trees. And it is, I mean, life is a game of luck. But I watch those programmes and you clearly love doing it. I do indeed. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm, I'm very fascinated, not particularly by railways, to tell you the truth, but very much by history hmm. and by the people I meet and by the stories. I find the activity <clears throat> surprisingly similar to being uh, a minister. Because somebody, as it were, gives me a bit of paper with a brief on it. I read it, stick it in my pocket, and, as it were, go with it. You know, I do the word. So, actually, it's terribly similar to being a minister. Someone else has done the research and the work, but they put me on the spot and I have to do the words. And um, I do it with, uh, with, with passion because there's no point doing anything without passion and commitment. And I'm also somewhat aware that there are lots of people who can't travel. This has been particularly true of the last two, two years where almost no one has been able to travel. <laughs> but even before that, you know, there are people who are elderly or disabled or whatever. And <clears throat> I have a big responsibility to, to travel on their behalf. I'm travelling, they are travelling with me Interesting. vicariously. Interesting. And so, you know, there has to be the passion of the journey, there has to be the description, there has to be the joy of discovery. And I must say everything is a discovery to me. I mean, I, I don't go into it... I hope, you know, proselytising or pontificating, because I don't know this stuff. I find it out as I go along. No, you turn up in a place <coughs> and you learn the story. People tell me things. Yeah, and the, I find mm -hmm. the history side of it personally very, very interesting. Well, thank you. I mean, that's the bit that, uh, that motivates me. Yeah, no, um, I love it. I love it. Now, Michael, you know, long career in politics, <coughs> long career as a commentator, <coughs> and you've seen Margaret Thatcher with the Western yes. Crisis, and we've uh, seen John Major with... ERM and back to basics and goodness knows what and David Cameron, uh, you know, trying to deal with the referendum and Theresa May in trouble. So you've seen lots and lots of Conservative leaders in crisis mode. How much trouble is Boris in? Huge. <clears throat> and um, truth and falsehood, I think, are the most dangerous grounds for prime ministers. You mentioned Margaret Thatcher and the Westland crisis. Many people won't remember this now. But there was a day when she went down to the House of Commons and she thought she might not be Prime Minister by that evening. We thought she might not be Prime Minister by that evening. House of Commons is a sort of medieval trial by water, you know. Um, and what happened was that on that occasion, Neil Kinnock, the leader of the opposition, did not make a good speech. And she was saved. But the thing that was lethal to her was her integrity was in question. It was whether she had briefed against one of her own ministers. That was, and this was Michael Heseltine? No, actually, it was Leon Britton. I oh, think, was it? Was the was one. Heseltine resigned, didn't Heseltine, Heseltine resigned. And, um, no, it was, it was all... I think it was about Leon Britton, okay. who was the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. And um, I think that was the way around it was. Yeah. Anyway, it was, about in, it was about integrity, which yeah. was terribly important in her case because she was a person of integrity. <laughs> it's, rather, it's rather the other way around this time, as it were, <laughs> because Boris, um, you know, has been caught out being economical with the truth. It's because he has a history of poor integrity that it is so lethal to him. But I think all of us have noticed that of all the things that Boris has done, you know, the chaotic private life, even the chaotic way of managing the government, Many of these things have been like water off a duck's back, as far as he was concerned, as far as the public was concerned. But when we got into this business of the parties that were held in Downing Street, mm. the public mood mm. seemed to change mm. conclusively. And the reason for that is very obvious, and it's been terribly well expressed by hundreds of people now. 
about what they went through in the crisis and the contrast with what uh, Boris and the number 10 lot were doing. So this is, I think, absolutely lethal. Is it arrogance in number 10 that <clears throat> they were behaving? It, it seems to be almost worse than that, almost a lack of human empathy. I mean, when they... I mean, I go back to thinking that the regulations were wrong, they were unreasonable, they were inhumane, they were excessive. And I think that there just wasn't the empathy to understand what it meant for your mother to be dying and you not to be allowed to see her, for, for the funeral to occur and you not to be allowed to go there. You see, I'm, as, I'm not terribly puzzled by Boris's behaviour. I'm very puzzled by this fellow called Martin Reynolds, who is the mm. private secretary to the Prime Minister. What on earth was he thinking? is the private secretary to the Prime Minister doing it, 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 in the middle of a lockdown, sending out an invitation to what, on the surface, would appear to be an illegal gathering? What has happened to well, the civil service? It did say at the bottom, bring your own booze. <laughs> oh, it's fairly well, no, uh, but, you know, one has to be careful about libel. I would say, you know, what on the surface could appear to be a criminal matter. Uh, how on earth did this happen? What, what has happened to... Uh, I mean, I think there's a whole list of things. You know, Simon Case, what was Simon Case doing judging these matters when for allegedly a, he'd been at one of the parties? For a very brief period. What was the head of the Foreign Office doing sunning himself at his villa when, when we were trying to get people out of Afghanistan. What has happened to the civil service? I'm, I'm, I'm as shocked by that as anything else. But anyway, look, the important, yeah. point, the important point today is Boris... I mean, and, he apologised today to the Commons. Right. But not, then sort of qualified it. I thought, I thought your analysis was um, spot on. I thought it was very subtle what you said, that you didn't use the word sorry. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's, it matters. It's, it's a matter of semantics, but it matters. Yeah. I agree with you that the first paragraph was great. The second paragraph, the garden is an extension of the office. Yeah, 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 this was yeah. becoming very mealy-mouthed at this point, so that was not so good. <clears throat> but I think it is... Um, I think it's lethal. I mean, I've changed my view on this quite recently. I did a, an interview with Liam Halligan just before Christmas, and I was emphasising the point that Boris is an amazing election winner, proven election winner, that the Tories would be crazy to get rid of him. But in the last few weeks, it seems now that he's a proven electoral liability. So I think the two questions for the Tory party would be, you know, is there any possibility that he could recover from this? If the election is still three years away, will people by then have forgotten the anger that they feel today? It's possible. Three years is quite a long time. I mean, try and remember what yeah. was going on three years ago. Three years is a long time, so it's possible. Yeah, but when trust is breached... And then second question, surely also, are we simply going to see one thing like this after another, after another, after, mm. after another... And, you know, the dismal business over Owen Paterson, I think before we even got into the revelation of the first party, I think, you know, most Tories would now conclude that um, it is likely that the chaos will continue, that life mm. will always be like this. But uh, make no mistake, the Tories would be taking an enormous risk if they dumped Boris because they're getting rid of someone who at least, you know, won elections pretty consistently in the past. Two mayoral elections, yeah, yeah, a referendum, yeah, yeah, yeah. a referendum and uh, then the majority of 80, and they'll trade him in for Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, um, in many ways, better candidates, better, better able to be Prime Minister, I dare say. But can they win elections? I but don't know. Could be an outsider. Could be someone that we haven't thought of. Whoever it is, it's not a proven election winner. That's my point. No, no, I get that. Bor Boris was the most exceptional choice as mm. Conservative leader because he had this extraordinary record of winning elections. So, in a way, they weren't taking a chance on that. They knew that. But it doesn't, doesn't feel very Conservative, does it? The fanatical drive to net zero, the extension of government into our lives in every area, the increase on tax, national insurance, uh, barely lifted a finger. I don't, know, I don't know what the Conservative Party is now. Well, that's the no, point no. I'm making. I mean, so... But I mean, you know, there, there are at least two and probably three Conservative parties... Uh, you were just talking earlier about the Scottish Conservative Party, yeah. which is going off on its own. Let's leave that to one side for a moment. Although, I think it is very important what has happened there because you can't, you can't have a separate Scottish Conservative Party. And if they're saying the Prime Minister should go, I think that starts uh, a landslide. But the other sense in which there's uh, more than one party, talk about the Red Ball seats. I mean, these Red Ball MPs, they are not, I think, Thatcherite. They're, you know, they're longing for public spending in their constituencies. They're levelling up. They're levelling up. And so, you know, that's not the conservatism mm. that I knew or that I remember. Mm. And, and they're, they're quite an important group. And, of mm. course, to some extent, if they stay there, they are the future of the party. So I, I, it's not quite clear, you know, to what a conservative leader has to appeal. But anyway, my summary of where we are now, I'm not sure 
Let, let, let me ask myself an easy question. Will he be leader at the next election? No. Mm. Will he be leader in a year's time? I, I don't think so. No. Will you make it through to the um, local elections? I wouldn't count on that. Interesting. Now, let's remind ourselves what sort of conservative <laughs> you were. Let's have a look at Michael. Oh, Pitt. no. Let's have a look. Let's embarrass him. Let us. Let us teach our children the history of this remarkable country. I don't mean the wishy-washy sociological flim-flam that passes for history in many of our schools today. I don't mean the politically correct debunking anti-patriotic nonsense of modern textbooks. I mean the real history of heroes and bravery, of good versus evil, of freedom against tyranny. The SAS have a famous motto. Who dares, wins. We dare. We will win. Oh, proper stuff. I'd vote for that. That's patriotic concern. <laughs> I'm teasing you a bit with that. But, I mean, you were a contender. I thought I thought you were going to go all the way. I, 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 yes, Marlon Brando. I was a, <laughs> I, I was a contender. Um, I haven't re-watched that speech. And I'm, I'm quite struck by how similar some of the themes are. All that stuff about yes. a de yes. debunking political history. Correctness, political correctness, education. Who knew that that was so big even then? Of course, we didn't have the word wokery in those days. No, but, or cancel you know, culture, but that's or what you were talking about. We're still talking yeah. about the same thing. Yeah. Yes. yeah, no, absolutely. So it didn't quite happen, but you've, <laughs> you've made a great life for yourself. And, of course, you've been busy broadcasting. And on that theme, where are we going with the BBC in this country? It's been such an important part of our lives very important part of our lives. Do we continue with the licence fee? Do we go on as we are with the BBC? The uh, analogy I've used before is that the BBC is a polar bear standing on a shrinking piece of ice because the licence fee, I don't think, can possibly survive. Now, this is not an attack on the BBC. In fact, I defend the BBC. I want the BBC to prosper. Mm. But I don't think that the licence fee is in the medium to long term defensible because we have such a multiplicity of channels, why on earth should one of them uniquely be financed by a sort of taxation? Well, it is a tax, really. It's, it's really a tax. So I don't, think, I don't think that is a sustainable position. And meanwhile, the BBC, funnily enough, has not set out to perform its public service duty. So if you look at the schedules now, it's very difficult to find um, excellent classical music or marvellous history lectures. I'm talking in particular about television. Radio is still pretty well sustained, but television has become pretty anti-culture on the BBC. So I don't think the position is sustainable. Therefore, I think the BBC should have been from years ago working to find an alternative way of surviving. And, uh, you know, one always has this very sad reflection that 15, 20 years ago, Netflix was a video rental store and the BBC was an enormous global name with a fantastically prestigious reputation. And today Netflix has taken over the world and the BBC is seeing its income shrinking year by year. So I think they've got something wrong. I mean, I've just, just spent a month in Spain and it is so tiresome to me that as soon as I get there, even though I pay my licence fee, I can't watch the BBC because I happen <laughs> not to be in the United Kingdom at the yeah. time. I mean, I think, you know, the BBC should be available to everyone in the world over a pay barrier, by all means, like other television is. But it should be available to everyone in the world. And I, w what they've done, I think, is they have expended their resources in defending what they've got, not realising that that's their disadvantage. I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's like many of our trade unions, you know, the NUM defending the coal mines. Yeah. And what we actually and need, the world's moving on. We needed to look to what was coming next. Yeah, no, and that's, I think that's been the failure of leadership in the, in the BBC. However, um, they do pay most of my income, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to make it very clear that I, I support the BBC. I just think it should be funded differently. <laughs> Michael Portello, thank you for joining me. <laughs> thank you. On Talking Great to see you. <laughs>